It is a real honor to be here with you. It's kind of an unexpected honor for me, though. I am, I am the Episcopalian daughter of a Reformed Jewish father and a mother who grew up Baptist and then lapsed. In college, she lapsed. But I had this Baptist grandmother, and I like to imagine that those roots kind of cobble me into being, you know, an in-law or a cousin or something. And, and I just need to note that despite what we heard last night from Dr. Leonard about how Anglicans historically have, like, mocked and derided Baptists for your audacious, wild behavior, it was like in the 18th century, despite that history, um, today I think that our two communities have a lot in common. I, I was kind of nervous about giving this talk, like giving a big talk with the community that you don't really know intimately is um, presumptuous. And so I had lots of conversations over the last semester about what, what I should bring to you tonight. And finally, a friend of mine said, Lauren, just imagine that you're talking to Episcopalians who don't use incense. It might be like slightly more complex than that, the differences between our communities. And, and I want to note that I am very grateful, um, in particular to my Baptist students at Duke, in particular to my female Baptist students at Duke, some of whom are here tonight, who've taught me an awful lot about a kind of disciplined courage. I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful to be here um, normally, at this stage of an address, where you don't really know me, I, I would tell you the story of like how I became a Christian after growing up with the lapsed Baptist and the Reformed Jew. Um, and I'd tell you about this dream that involved being kidnapped by mermaids and rescued by someone who looked like Daniel Day Lewis. Um, but I think tonight, in order to give you a sense of our perhaps shared ecclesial location, I'll instead tell you a little story about my church, and this story comes from last September. Um, it was the kickoff of our adult ed program at my small, wonderful, beloved, strange Episcopal church. And just, just so you know, like I think a lot of people hear Episcopal church and they picture like people dressed to the nines and, you know, the beautiful people, where, where the people who pretend that they have everything together goes. That is not my church. Um, I often feel like I'm going to church in a Flannery O'Connor short story. We're sort, of, we're sort of the halt and the lame, and we have all that on display at my church. And anyway, it was September, and we were starting our adult education program with a kickoff pie social. And it was a Wednesday night, and I was at school, and around 3 p.m. I asked three of my students who attend this same church, and one of them was our new intern. I asked them if they wanted to like have a bite to eat with me before the kickoff pie social, and they said yes, and that made me feel like I was a cool professor who was involved in my students' lives and so forth. And then at 4 o'clock, I had this really invigorating phone conversation with my new spiritual director, Gene, and I was just on this real high from that conversation. And so then at five, I headed out to my car to go to the restaurant and meet the three students for dinner. And I was just pretty pumped. This kind of churchy adult ed pie thing is just the sort of thing that I really love. And I was very thrilled about the conversation with Jean, my spiritual director. And then I got most of the way to my car and realized that at some point in the day, my car key, which isn't really a key, it's one of those black keypads, which turn out to cost $450 to replace. Um, at some point, my keypad had fallen off of my keychain. So I looked through my purse and I retraced my steps through Duke Gardens and I went back to my office and couldn't find my key. And I just kind of flipped. I mean, these sort of keeping body and soul things together, these ordinary, normal, quotidian things, these things undo me when they go wrong. And I couldn't get my students on the phone, so they're like waiting for me at this restaurant and I'm not showing up. And finally, I got one of them, the intern, and her first intern act was to come pick me up and take me to the pie social. And the other students brought me dinner, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this at a Baptist gathering, but when I walked in, one of them handed me a coffee mug with red wine in it. 
And whatever fantasy I had about Lauren as the cool professor kind of dissolved as my students took care of me. And then there was the actual adult ed pie social part. So the sound, which thankfully I was not in charge of, the sound was iffy. So half of my table couldn't hear the video we were watching as the actual education in the adult ed of the evening. Um, as the video played, I realized, both to my sort of amusement and annoyance, that several of the talking heads, the experts on the video, I realized that I knew some of them. Nora Gallagher, Phyllis Tickle, Tracy Lynn, some of these people I count as pretty good friends. And I mostly managed to silence the voice of like insecure ego in my head, but I didn't manage to silence it completely. So sometime during the video, the voice said, how come Nora was invited to be in this film and I was not? Then, and this is really typical of my beloved parish, then no one at my table would talk about what we were supposed to talk about after the video ended. The rector, Anne, she had told us that while watching the video, we were supposed to jot down things that caught our attention, like things we agreed with or disagreed with, and then we were supposed to talk about those things for 20 minutes. So everyone at my table just wanted to talk about the video as such, like they wanted to critique its videoness. One of them said it used too much insidery lingo. All the people on the video, she said, seemed to be well-educated and middle class, not sufficiently, di this is an Episcopalian making this critique, mind you, not sufficiently diverse. Everyone was sporting expensive haircuts and long, dangly, artsy earrings. Another person said, did you see the promotional materials for this video series? It turns out that the promotional materials are very low rent. They wouldn't do at all. So I just tried to channel the rector, Anne. She would have known how to get people to talk about the content of the video, like how to get them to talk about their reactions to what Nora and the other successful talking heads had to say about sin or Jesus or the Holy Spirit. I pretty much failed at that task. I think we spent about 17 minutes talking about the promotional materials and the earrings, and we said maybe three minutes of things about Jesus. Still, despite the sound system's malfunction and my total failure as a table facilitator, there was something abundant about this pie social. It was that kind of potluck where you take a sliver of everyone's pie because this was the offering of the people. And it was the kind of potluck where you eat too much so that you don't hurt anyone's feelings. And you might even fib a little at this kind of potluck and say that the pecan cream pie was better than you actually thought that it was. I thought it was disgusting. <laughs> so that's where I am. I'm in this church where sometimes we are too uncomfortable to talk about Jesus, but somehow there's some abundance and you're fed by the offering that your neighbor in the church can make, and you remember as you're fed by that offering that it was Jesus, after all, who came to give us life more abundant, and so then maybe it might be okay to talk about him, or even more radically, to talk to him from time to time. That's where I am in my church life. 